Good morning, Berean. It's uh, good to see you on this, our Lord's Day. We want to welcome you to Berean Bible Baptist Church. We welcome those who are online and at home uh, joining us in worship this morning. Uh, what a great opportunity for us this morning. This is our second, I believe, uh, third, wow, time is flying, our third Missions Emphasis Sunday. And uh, we are so thankful uh, for these opportunities to uh, get caught up with our missionaries that we that we uh, support both here in the U.S. and abroad. And uh, this morning, uh, we have the uh, treat of having the Marshalls with us this morning. Uh, we know that many of you have been praying for them throughout the year, of course. You, are, you seek the Lord's will on behalf of their health and their, the uh, impact of their ministry. And so we can't wait to hear uh, how the Lord has been using them over these last few years since we saw them last time uh, to continue the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in Spain. And so uh, I'm going to just um, open us in a word of prayer and then turn it over to uh, Brother Ted and, uh, and Eva so that they can uh, uh, catch us up on what God has been doing uh, in their lives over these last few years. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks for this day. We thank you so much, Lord God, for the privilege of being here this morning uh, to get caught up with the marshals. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for their labor of love for the Lord Jesus Christ, even in difficult circumstances. They continue to do the work of the Lord. What a witness, what a testimony to us, what a challenge to us in our own lives uh, that we ought to be ministering no matter what we're going through. We just pray, Heavenly Father, for this time this morning that you would bless it and encourage us through it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's welcome the marshals this morning. Thank you. I get up here. My heart is already overflowing with thanksgiving for you all, for your prayers, for your testimony, for your perseverance, the kindnesses and your support and partnership uh, with us. As it says in Philippians 1, 3, it says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. And then that challenging verse below it, which joins with other verses, always giving thanks for, for all things, giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. So our hearts are, are melted with thanksgiving for your identification with us across the pond over in Spain. My name is Ted Marshall. For those of you who do not know, my wife, Ava, and also my son, Obed. We also have a son in the U.S., Lucas, who lives here in the States. Where is Spain? We're across the, the pond and this little peninsula of Spain and uh, Portugal. And <clears throat> Spain is, is deep and rich culturally. We still have bullfights. We still have the running of the bulls, which I guess is even more famous now. We have tomato festival where people are, are having a, a free for all with tomatoes. We have uh, some of the best ham in the world. We have a choice first-class wine. We have a top world-class soccer league. We have beaches that are second to none in the Mediterranean and around the peninsula. And we have architecture from Barcelona to Madrid to the north to, to where we are, which is Galicia, the state of Galicia, which is just above Portugal, up in the northwest corner. And it's like the size of a, of a state. And we see that uh, it, where, where we live, we walk. We walk in our city. We walk to our English classes. Uh, we even walk to the hospital, which is up the hill a ways. Uh, the cuisine of eating is, is world-renowned. Uh, that second little so second picture up here 
uh, is one of my favorites, which is octopus. <laughs> Anybody for octopus this morning? Walking in the streets, the architecture, the cafes are all famous to uh, our region. And also, Galicia is known as the land terra de megas, the land of witches. And in this, this beautiful culture, we have a deep, ingrown uh, culture of witchcraft and superstition bound in with the works system of the Roman Catholic Church. So that is basically the culture. And while the culture is so rich in so many different uh, directions, it is spiritually very, very poor and needy. And less than 1% of the, the population is professing evangelical uh, Christian. So I have a video. I don't know whether, we'll see how this goes. And this is the region, the, the state of Galicia. See some of the coasts. And there is a, uh, a lighthouse. And that is what the church is meant to be to show forth Christ. See our coastline. Some of the villages, the village life is very rich, small towns. They all have Roman Catholic churches. Yeah. Our land is dark spiritually, but it's <laughs> not. There's an idea of our coastline, and it is a rugged coastline, and the water during the, the hottest summer months is still cold. <laughs> and also, we are, in, we are in Lugo, which is like a county, county of the state, if you want to use that. It's a province of Lugo, and we are in the county seat, or the capital of... <coughs> of Lugo, we live in a, a Roman walled city, which spiritually and physically is, is very real. This was built, it's the last or the only Roman built complete wall. And even a police car can get up on top of it still. It is a wonder and uh, it's a wonder to behold, and we live with it, we walk on it, and we live inside this, uh, this walled city. And spiritually, it speaks to us of a walled-up mind and heart against the gospel and against God. And that is why God sent us there is to be light in the midst of this this darkness. You can see here on the wall how people walk on the wall. See our streets in Lugo City. Uh, again, the, the food is, is very, uh, the cuisine of, of Lugo and Galicia 
is very prominent in our festivals. And <clears throat> this is, and we have museums that are first class. They make some of the American museums, if I might compare them, uh, they, they have a, a very uh, professional touch to the museums and uh, very high class uh, museums of Roman artifacts as well as Celtic, uh, which those two things are the, the deep roots of our area, of Lugo and of Galicia, Celtic and Roman uh, roots. And I have a little picture. You're going to see some of the Roman Catholic uh, monasteries, churches, the countryside of, of Lugo. And as I say, there is, in the smallest of towns, you will find a big uh, Roman Catholic church. And people still devoted in their minds and their hearts to that works uh, system. So I have a little, little video about Lugo and uh, where exactly we live. And you'll see some uh, Celtic uh, ruins in there also. get that at the beginning or no yeah is that a I don't think it did the front of it. there's a Celtic ruins close line clock keeps ticking, not only for my time up here, but in each of our lives, tick tock, and I don't mean the application. Things have changed for us. Since I was here last time, and I know in our lives, uh, God has begun a good work in us, and he will finish it under the day of Jesus Christ, and there are changes in our lives. I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. Do you? We make our plans, the clock keeps ticking, ticking along. This was the verse that God used to uh, guide me and to charge me again to go back to Spain, 2010, and the work. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Church planting, we planted a church in Chantada, which I know you all prayed for. And also as chaplain at the prison and also chaplain at the hospital and with uh, meetings going to churches on the coasts, both in the north and in the south and as well as in, in Chantada. And then COVID comes along. You see it down there at the, the bottom there. And that was a, a, a big change. And I thought, I thought, here's the Lord getting the attention of everybody all at once to find out where and who and who are you trusting and whom you have believed. 
But there were big changes that came. And instead of going to the, the prison, I was, I, was, I was heading out one day, uh, to, uh, ready to go back into the prison, and all of a sudden they called, and it was closed down, and it was shut down, and the prison, everything, because of COVID and these kind of things. We all experienced different, uh, different stages of all, of all of that. Well, this was a, this was a t time of change for us also. And instead of going to church planting and going out and, and hospital chaplaincy and the prison chaplaincy, uh, the Lord brought us in deeper into the health and the health ministry. And here, here we, we, we began, uh, we, we all of a sudden, I think, it was at least for me, we're surrounded not only with friends who are doctors, we were going to a lot of doctors. My wife is diagnosed with a rare disease, and that involves a lot of visits to the doctor and tests, and I think we're all, uh, we all understand that. And so those health issues were getting into the hospital every week, going constantly. That's where our doctors are. And we begin to make friends. We have doctors in church. We have Dr. Uh, Ruth. And we have, uh, I have an, uh, <coughs> I'll get into this a little bit, but I have an, uh, a spinal surgeon who comes to New York City uh, to uh, do spinal surgery with uh, one of the world-renowned spinal surgeons. All, the worst cases in the world end up with this guy. He, and I, I have class with a spinal surgeon who goes and works with him during the year for a short period of time. And he wanted to learn English, and pff, he learned English like this. Never had an English class, except uh, what we do. And so we had doctors all around us as friends in the church, and then we were going to different places and we had nurses and befriending and as the Christ in us begins another direction. Instead of going over here, we're in with Ula is the name of the hospital. I, had, uh, I have a cardiology disease and this is my cardiologist, uh, Carlos Juanate. And he, after my, my, my heart exam, he, I said, well, I teach English. He said, oh, I'm interested in that. You're going to be my English teacher. So at the uh, what, what, a stress test, when you go in for a stress test, has anybody had a stress test? OK. OK, good, brother. Uh, so I go in there, and he's doing stress tests on his patients, and he's, he's talking to me in English. And so we have, he knows that I'm the evangelical uh, chaplain at the hospital. And uh, he knows he has another friend who is a, a evangelical Christian. And so this is new. This is a new area. The last years uh, since we saw you last, this has been a big change. And this is where uh, we are. My wife uh, and son are in an association of uh, rare diseases. There's a rare D disease day uh, internationally and the possibility of getting into schools uh, with a rare uh, disease information into children and also on teachers. This is the cardiology department. And one day the head of cardiology was uh, my cardiologist. He has 24 cardiologists uh, in his department. And one day he's, he looked at one of the other cardiologists and said, this is the English teacher for the cardiology department. <laughs> So that has not been uh, had accom accomplished yet. But so this was a big change, and this is something uh, the that the Lord did to change direction and change our our relationship. English classes. I'm learning English, and I know some in here are very precise English. Uh, speakers and teachers and uh, very precise. Our English classes, we have English students, we get into families. But when we went to these, because of our health situation and so on, we went to the families, we open the windows, we wear masks, we are this 24-7. And 
getting in with the families, getting to know the families, opportunities in some of the families. It's very interesting. It came to me this morning. Instead of going to the prison to preach the gospel to these guys, which was, a, I, I love that. I must, I must say I, I, lo I loved going there. Not only with the fellowship of the guys that I was going with, but also we had souls that, that really needed the Lord and they knew it. Uh, but I just thought of something this morning. The Lord brought the prison to me. One of my English students is Maudo, who I've had. He's a high school student. And his father is director of the prison in Monte Rosso, where I was going. And all of a sudden, I mean, I have this, this relationship. I have a relationship with him already through his son for doing English the last three or four years. But it's also opened up another dimension. He knows what we did and what we do there at the, at the prison. And it's opened another uh, part, another dimension of the relationship that I have with Felix, who is the director of the, the prison. So English is something that we do, all three of us. We have English classes. Uh, I have English class with the, the spinal surgeon. I have spina, uh, the cardiologist. He went and spoke to a thousand cardiologists in Mexico, and he's in the European Association and doing all this kind of stuff. So I have classes with him also. Then evangelism. The churches where we, I was going in the north, on the coast in the north and also in the south and also in, in Chantada, that had its bumpy road during, during uh, COVID and was very difficult to, to get back doing. I also, every other day, send verses to about 50 people or so, and just going one verse at a time, I said, where do I begin? You know, there's so many devotionals out there, there's so many things, so just one verse at a time, and I ask a question. Well, what does, you know, uh, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And so you say, for by, and then they have to fill in the blank. Just one word in the verse, and we've gone through Ephesians, we've gone through First Peter, and we're, and we're going through, uh, and we're currently going through. Where am I going through? I don't know. Well, we've been through Ephesians, we've been through First Peter, and so these are evangelistic opportunities. And also, I returned to the North Coast, uh, one church up there, uh, to preach the the gospel, uh, preach the gospel to them. I don't know how much time I have. Is it over? Oh, 10.30. Okay, good, sir. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so these families and students uh, with English, as well as these doctors and nurses, uh, one nurse that befriended uh, and Ava befriended, it's a close friend now. And a lot of these relationships, instead of being the professional patient uh, to doctor and nurse uh, relationship, they're friends now. And God has given us great favor and he has answered prayers of, of Berea to, to give us that kind of favor and the penetration of the gospel through our lives uh, to these people. I want to finish thinking about why in the world am I doing this? Why do we do anything in life? And I start with this word, conversion. Why did, why did Jesus Christ come and save somebody like me? When I was dead, he gave me life. And when he gave me life, he raised me up. And when he raised me up, he seated me in the heavenly places in Christ. Why in the world did he do that? Three times it says here, so that. So that what? First, so that in the ages to come, whoa, is this for everybody or just for the pastor? So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us. Everybody in Christ for all the ages He's going to keep showing his kindness, the riches of his grace in kindness. He's going to show all that for eternity. 
This is a glorious gospel. So that... So that you can walk around like a peacock? No. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God so that... Not of works, so that... No peacocks here. So that no one may boast. That's what the gospel is. It's the gospel of God. No one's going to get up there and brag about their good works. Brag at who they are. There's one more so that. You know, when I, first after I was, I was born again up in Minnesota... God works up in the north. God works up in the north. Do we have any other Yankees that happen to fall down? Oh. Okay, well, a little bit here, okay. Uh, God works up in the north. I got saved in Minnesota. For by grace have you been saved through faith and out of yourselves is a gift of God, not a worse than any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. New creation. Created in Christ Jesus for you're not saved by works, but for God has a purpose for everyone sitting here. Designed purpose. And sometimes it changes from for you know going out there, preaching in the in the, in the prison and, and, and planting a new church out there. New church plant, you're going two th twice a week, two, three times, trying to find, get a Bible study here, get a Bible study there, praying hard every day. Changes that, okay, get sick. Now you're sick, but you have opportunities with doctors, nurses, other patients that you've never understood. Four good works which God prepared beforehand so that you gotta sow that. First you gotta sow that for all eternity, this splendor in us toward us in verse seven, toward us for eternity. I mean he's gonna show things. You think this creation is wonderful. For us? Whew. Toward us in Christ Jesus first. And then what? Nobody's going to boast. No, no braggards. Which God prepared for him. So that. For every single one of us. This morning. So that. We should walk. We would walk in them. Put your walking shoes on. I went to summer camps. Did anybody go to summer camp? Has anybody been to a summer camp? Do you go to summer camps around? I went to summer camp. I went to uh, Culver, Indiana, military. Great summer. No, it's fantastic. It's fantastic, really. I mean, it's all, all guys, you know, and they're out there and canoeing and, you know. I mean, it's summer camp. Anyhow, this is years ago. This is, I mean, this is a half a century. More. So at, at Culver, we would, we, would, we would march, you know, and we had our little uniforms and, and things like that. And so, but we went, and some of you who have been in the military, they, they said, he would say, eyes right. And everybody would, you know, you're walking along, you're marching along, and you have to look up there where the commander was and so on. Eyes right. Not only so that we would walk in them, but also the call to have our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ and see his call for us. Why do I have those phones up there? The default, the default of our lives is this, this phone. That's kind of the default now. Is that right? Or is it our fault?
The Christian is called into the fellowship with Jesus Christ. A person. Not a phone. And not the electronics. It's an actual person. When I went, when I went out to Spain, other young missionaries and stuff, we were... And at Bible school and, you know, different, different, uh, people are always talking about, are you called? Are you called, pastor, to uh, preach? Are you called here? And I, this is the verse that I always had as my call. This is the effectual calling verse that God calls us in Christ and makes us, causes us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is the verse. But this is the call to a person. To the Lord Jesus Christ. Called into fellowship with him. And the electronics and the phones and, and everything else, is that going to bring you to the person? Does it bring you to him? Because our fellowship, the calling, is to a person, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I, this is the only verse that ever came. This guy, he had a, a verse from Jeremiah. The call of God upon, upon I didn't have. But he calls everybody to be in fellowship with him. Every single one of us. To be in a deep, intimate Trusting fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Reality. Having reality of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. <clears throat> during, during and before and after, tomorrow, the Lord Jesus Christ is walking in the midst of his church. To have, to have fellowship. Giving us the way to overcome. We see him in his, his glory there at the beginning of, of the, uh, the book of the Revelation. And he comes in pen with his penetrating burning eyes to see and to know. And he says that seven times. I, I know, I know, I know, I know. Again and again, the local church. These were seven churches, local churches. And he comes in with his penetrating eyes to see us, to commend where it's commendable. No prosperity gospel there in the book of the Revelation. I, that hit me the other day as I was, I was meditating he, he, he speaks he speaks to the uh, the Smyrna church uh, I know your, your tribulation do not fear what you're about to suffer whoa some television programs can't, can't use that, that verse how about you going to jail you're going to suffer for my sake. What a privilege. What a privilege that is. And he's speaking to local churches. He's speaking to us as believers with penetration. Where are we at? We see him. This is, the, this is what the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lamps and says... We see him knowing he's giving us and telling us how to overcome in these situations. Knowing us. And we know that verse from Matthew where it says that I will build my church. COVID or in a hospital bed or wherever we are at I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against 
that. I end with this, this word, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias from the marshals, Ted, Ava, and Obed. And we have a prayer card for anyone that wants it uh, after we get finished. And I would love to uh, field any questions, if there are any questions at all, uh, be able to do that now. And I have a prayer letter which I digitally send out. Uh, if you would like to receive that, you can send me an email and give me your email address so I can add you to the list. And you'll have that at the bottom of the, uh, the, the prayer card. So if there are any questions, yes, sir. So um, I was unaware of the influence of uh, witchcraft. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. How do you all, I mean, is, is it still practice? How do you all approach it? There are festivals which are actually dedicated to uh, witchcraft uh, using uh, uh, oaths. Uh, it's in, and even in the Arde Lucas, which is the Roman festival, which you saw some of those Roman soldiers press around, there is a tent there which has little idols in it, and they're teaching the people uh, you know, as it was years ago with the, what was the name of that game that people, the kids were so innocently uh, using, and they were using actually witchcraft Ouija boards, and there was another one, I can't remember. There's so many of these dark games that kind of filter in as such innocence. So there are many festivals dedicated to that. And every year they will have magic uh, posters and stuff, it's just a very open thing. It's an open alternative. And on an individual basis, it just needs to be uh, dealt, dealt with uh, uh, from, that, from that standpoint. I don't know if that answers you, but... Uh, the majority of the people see it more as like a legend nowadays. They don't see it as witchcraft. They see it as something like positive. When it was really years ago, and it still is actual Again, the combination of the superstition and witchcraft and religion, the Roman Catholic religion in the towns and uh, wherever we are, is very prevalent. And every year they have a large, they have a large, it's like a convention. Uh, they had years ago in La Coruña, which is about an hour from ours, and uh, it was the it was the European witchcraft or magic uh, convention. So it's very prevalent still, and it's uh, uh, you know there's a side of us, there's a, a, a spirituality in each person that there is who's longing to see that other side, that dark side. Uh, so it's it's still much part of us. Yes. Is, uh, what, what is the flavor of Catholicism? The church is full, or is it cultural and not well attended? It's, it's not well attended. But as a, as a businessman told me years ago, I'm going to get back to the church before I die. And so the funerals, funerals and weddings, which COVID put a dent in, obviously all those big kind of, uh, it, it's, it's, it's so ingrained. And even while there's uh, the younger generations are not attending mass and uh, but they will get married in the Roman Catholic Church and you go to the funerals and so it's still a, a very harsh reality uh, and people's yeah I have one more question I was unaware Celtic because I always think Ireland when I see that word they got to us. They got to us. Not just Ireland and not just there, but the, the Celtic. I don't even know the exact year. The Celtics arrived first to the north of Spain, and then the Romans took over. So the Celtics lived there first, and then the Romans took over that land. So there's lots of Celtic ruins and lots of Celtic mythology. It's all mixed in there, and that was first there, yeah. in, the, in Galicia, which is the state. Yeah. Which is, and in all the north of Spain. They didn't get to the south. But they live all the north of Spain. We have a lot of vampires. 
your heart, this is first thing before anything. About the culture, our city where we live, um, because I was born again many years ago there, and I used to mix the religion with the superstition. I used to go to the cathedral to make my prayers, but at the same time, I throw the coins in the, um, what do you call it, the, like the filters for the air conditioning and the, and the heat. Uh, you put coins there for luck. And it's a little bit disturbing that both things at the same time, but it's what the people right. culturally, <laughs> culturally live like examples. that. Uh, we live like that. We used to live like that. I am not anymore. But my mother, for example, uh, in June there is another festival, and they call San Jung. Uh, in that festival, you have to pick it up all these flowers and leave the flowers uh, for a night, and you can wash yourself with the water that, where the petals, petals were soaking. Things like that, that they are, it's a mix of uh, the darkness. But uh, our city is, uh, they were the Romans and the Celtic uh, culture. And, Sometimes they are, now they are uh, doing new things in the city, like underground parkings, and they move everything, and you can find, they, they found there coins, uh, bonds, uh, um, jewelry, uh, and the houses, pottery. pottery, and the houses where they used to live. And the Roman, and the wall was for, uh, to defend the, the Romans, the city from the, uh, uh, the Celtic culture, and they build up all these walls to, uh, for battle. And it's what we, uh, is the culture. Um, well, uh, many challenges, challenges in these last years, in these few years that we, uh, everybody has their own challenges. But uh, uh, for me personally, like Ted's wife has been very difficult uh, because, um, our life has changed because of um, because my illness. Um, you can feel very guilty sometimes uh, because it's like you are stopping uh, your husband to to do other things that his heart is is burning to do that, like going to the prison. But the Lord stopped that because the COVID. Um, but I trust God that he will open these things again. But uh, he has been very faithful to the Lord and, and to us. And, and like he said, mm, we are entering in these small families um, because they are very humble. Some, they are uh, daughters, and he's with the, <laughs> with the high class. I am more with the... <laughs> These families that they are very humble, humble working yeah. hard, um, and I go day by day, few, few classes. I have few classes, but I feel that it's God's opportunity. He has a little bit more in the afternoons, and always has his um, classes and, and, and other, thi uh, other things. But uh, they always ask me, how are you feeling, Eva? And always, 
not always, not every day, but God always opens a moment to talk about, well, they know that we are Christians, and this is a shock. Always they say, your faith, your faith, and I can speak with some that they are older, well, not with the little ones, because they can say that I am washing their brains. And, but with the, yeah, they know that we are, uh, well, that I am a born again Christian and only by God, by his grace. And they know when I was hospitalized that it's very scary to like, when I was choking for so long and I couldn't swallow. But they know that when I said, well, I know God was with me and he was, he is still and he has his plan. They don't understand. They start with questions and it's good that they have questions. But well, I want to say thank you to you all and, and thank you for loving us and having us here and praying for us because there are many challenges that you all have. But, but thank you, you know, have to, I want to speak. Yes. They're being a lighthouse. No, I, I probably confused it. Uh, the church is to be that lighthouse. We are the light. We okay. are the show forth Christ. Okay. And I just kept thinking about that. That's a dark. Huh? Yeah, we'd like to have a church up there. That would, that would be that would be beautiful. Anything else? Question here. Yes. Yeah, for you to be able to effectively minister to the people there with their different practices, how much do you feel you had to learn of their occult practices to be able to speak to them effectively? There's a, there's, there's a lot more need in that occult area that I was ignorant of. I was very ignorant. Um, and I think that that is a, that's a very important point. And the spiritual battle, which you are the heavy ar artillery, uh, missions is the cooperative body of Christ. And it's, it's not, you know, the maverick. And to go into a dark culture and to talk to individual people and to... Uh, who are who are involved in the occult? My own family over there, as well as friends, uh, are are very superstitious people. Uh, so that's a that's a very it's a very important point, and uh, especially young people, I think too. Uh, you know, the dark things are are just innocently accepted. And without the gospel light, nobody's going to see it. And uh, so you are the heavy artillery. We're over there to, to preach the gospel. And thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your, your partnership. And uh, I don't know whether I answered that question. I don't. The question is. Good. Uh, this, I, need, I need a lot of help. The, uh, Generally, the, the, the person over there is superstitious and Roman Catholic and do, try and do, do as the best they can, you know, try to get along and stuff. Whereas here, you have a different mindset over here in America. And while there are still many people, depending on their good works and trying to, to do it that way, you don't have this other dark side generally to deal with. Uh, whereas over there in Spain, it is part of their life. It is just something that they've grown up with uh, through the generations. And if I could leave one prayer request, it would be that Second, Th Second Thessalonians uh, 3 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord would speed rapidly and be glorified just as it did with you in our relationships with the people, the doctors, the nurses. Uh, <sighs> Going to prison, going to preaching in the church, yes. 
but in the individual, in tight, close relationships with these people and how we walk. That the word of the Lord, we would have opportunities for the word of God with, with different people, with students. I've had students, these young kids, oh, he's a religious man. That, that could be passed around to all of our English students. So we are, it's a very fine line, it's a very sensitive uh, thing to talk to them and to be light uh, in the conversations and to be light uh, to them. But those, those are the opportunities that God gives us. And I had wonderful opportunity with one, one Gabriel, who is going to a very expensive, going to study genetics in Madrid. Had wonderful opportunities with him this past year. And the mother knew that. I said, because the kid wanted to talk about all these, he wanted to talk about God, and he wanted to talk about Christ, and he wanted to talk about you Protestants and all this kind of stuff, you know? So, uh, you know, <laughs> okay, let's, let's, get, let's get at this. You know, I love that. And a young guy, I mean, very smart, very, very brilliant guy. And so I told his mother, I said, look, I am this, I am a, a true believer in Jesus Christ, and, you know, telling her what, and she, ha, she knows my wife from, uh, from schoolhood, uh, school age, uh, years ago, uh, and uh, so I told her, I said, you know, our conversations are this, I'm talking about this, and I just wanted to let you know that, I'm trying not to, but this guy is, I mean, he's just alive on, you know, every subject that there is, you know, and, uh, and so I had wonderful opportunities with him. I had wonderful opportunities with the son of the, uh, the um, director of the prison. Wonderful opportunities with some of these, these young kids and uh, for, for the gospel. And I know my wife and uh, I, the opportunities that the Lord has opened. And this, this, is, this is where the Lord has us uh, focused and heading in those directions. The, so that uh, the, the works that God has prepared before him, that we should walk in them. So that we should walk in them. Do love you guys. Love seeing your faces. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Praise the Lord. That was wonderful. Great update. How we want to. Uh, just thank the Lord for the years of service and labor that the uh, marshals have put in spreading the gospel. Um, Tuesday is my missions prayer day. At, I have a subject that I pray for every day, and so Tuesday is my missions prayer day. And uh, this has really been an answer to my prayers because over the last two years, on Tuesday mornings, I've been praying that God would enable our missionaries to come up with creative ways to continue the ministry in light of COVID. Um, the world has changed, ministry has changed, uh, the access that you have to people on a personal level has been adjusted. And so we need to really be praying that our missionaries uh, come up with ways in which uh, they can get in front of saved and unsaved people, that they can share God's word, uh, see the saved encouraged, uh, see the unsaved come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Master. And so I hope that you're praying regularly for our missionaries, just as we have challenges as a church. Um, some of our members are still at home. Some are coming to church. Missionaries have those same challenges. And so, so we need to be praying that as the ministry uh, takes maybe a little bit different form for them, uh, that God would uh, continue to do his work of uh, labor uh, through their labor uh, in accomplishing the spread of the spread of the gospel. On Missions Emphasis Sundays, uh, you don't kind of see this behind the scenes going on, but we have a, a missions leadership team, and uh, they get in contact with our missionaries. They dialogue with them. They, sh they take the prayer requests in and keep a, keep a booklet. And um, one of the things that we do when our missionaries come is uh, we um, give them a love offering. We also pay for some of their travel expenses and other things that, uh, they, are, that they need taken care of. Now, you don't normally see that as a congregation. At the end of the year, we give you a, a, a layout of what we've given to our missionaries. So if you dig in, you can kind of see it. But uh, you don't see the, the uh, transaction taking place normally. Well, today is kind of special because this year, as you know, out during our VBS, our children uh, had a project for raising funds. And the uh, object of their fundraising was the marshals. 
And so uh, it's not normal that a missionary would necessarily be in town when the VBS has just done their fundraising, uh, but they're here and we thank the Lord for them. And so we have a special gift on top of what we give them normally. And uh, if uh, Ted and Ava would come forward, please, I just uh, right here, please. And I just want to uh, hand them uh, two checks. One check is the normal check, but I want to also give them a check from the VB from VBS from our children, and they raised. $2,053 for the Marshall family. Isn't God good? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm going to pray. Uh, of course, uh, the Marshalls would not be able to, to stay with us, so I wanted to leave some time for you to come up and welcome, welcome them, thank them for their ministry, and just tell them that, that, that you love them. So we want to leave a little time for interaction uh, in between service. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and uh, the marshals will be, will be up here, and uh, you can greet them before they have to leave. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks uh, for the Marshall family. Thank you, Lord God, for their <clears throat> labor. Thank you, Lord God, that you're helping them to come up with creative ways in which uh, they can continue to minister in light of what's going on in the world. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless them, that you would uh, touch Ava's body, that you, Heavenly Father, would bring healing to her. We pray, Lord God, for the kids, uh, for the grandkids, uh, for your will to be done in their lives. We pray for Ted as he labors with the, uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you would use him mightily to accomplish your divine intention, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.
I have your Sunday morning announcements. Evening Bible study will begin at 6 p.m. tonight. The service will begin with the review and question session of the morning message. You can text or email your questions. Pastor Skeppel will continue in the study of 2 Thessalonians. Wednesday night prayer. You are invited to join us in prayer via Zoom at 7 p.m. The link will be posted in the church's app, or you may call the church for more information. August Combined Sunday School has begun. Join us again next week as we continue to investigate Work Redeemed with the hope of being Christ's person on the job. The Media Department. Volunteers are needed to assist in different areas of the Media Department. Training will be provided so you don't have to have computer, you don't have to be a computer geek, and some of the work can be done off-site. If you are interested, please see Brother Capel Davis. And now Earl Lewis has an announcement for you. Morning, Marian. Just wanted to give you all an update on where we are with um, Labor Day. We're about three weeks out. Hope you all are excited. Um, we have, um, <laughs> thank you. We certainly have um, a great announcement in terms of our communications department. Um, we have a new lead for our communications, which is Mr. John Adams, brother up there. And uh, absolutely. And uh, he's hit the ground running, got lots of ideas already uh, that he's thrown out, wants to do a lot of things on social media. Uh, however, this Saturday, uh, this coming Saturday, he plans to kind of canvas the area, uh, possibly this area, possibly the Camp Creek um, uh, marketplace area as well. Uh, we definitely need some individuals to step up and help him out in that, in that area. So if you uh, feel comfortable passing out um, flyers, if you don't feel comfortable passing out flyers, you can pray about it. We can still get there um, and do that with him. So uh, that will be this Saturday um, in the morning. So, all right, so Saturday morning, if you have time, don't have a set schedule right now because it's uh, kind of late in the game. So we want to find out where that time may be for individuals that volunteer, and then we'll get that, uh, get that set time established. Um, it will be this Saturday and then something else that following week as well. So please uh, be in prayer about that if you can help out in that area, we would definitely be thankful for that. Um, also, uh, we have other areas of need as well. So the, um, the announcement was sent out again just yesterday. So if you have not signed up for any, any place to volunteer, please do so, uh, so that we can serve our area um, with excellence to the glory of God. Thank you. Awana will be starting soon and volunteers are needed. If you are interested in teaching boys and girls the gospel of Christ, please see Pastor Perkins. If anyone needs prayers or if you are seeking a church home and need information on becoming a member of our church, an elder will be available each Sunday after service in, the, by, in front of the organ. Excuse me. Let's see. Our missionary prayer highlight is Reverend and Mrs. John and Rachel Sherwood. Cross Worlds Ministry. Mission Field is Atlanta, Georgia. The Shortwoods have been on the mission field since 1984. They are currently ministering to international students from Georgia State University, Georgia Tech, and Emory, and their neighbors in the underserved areas of Atlanta. For our sick and shut in, we have Carl Allen, Carol Allen, Frederick Ball, Juanita Ball, Elder Bibbs, George Brown, Hugh Chinson, Azure DeBose, Elder Knox, Gloria Marshall, Joanne McLean, Joyce Nelson, Aladdin Jones, Vicki Robinson, Teresa Skeppel, Candace Zachary. Our missionaries are Naima Johnson, Ava Marshall, Obed Marshall, and Judy Payne, and Walter Robinson. We have a happy birthday to Joyce Taylor, August 14th, Fred McGavock on August 15th, and Philip Lewis on August 19th. Happy anniversary to Mr. and Mrs. Luverne and Betty Welch, August 14th, 40 years. And Mr. and Mr. and Deaconess Rod and Deborah Ponder, August 17th, 41 years. Our scripture for the week is 1 Timothy 5.3, honor widows who are widows indeed. Thank you.
Good morning, Berean. Good morning. This is our call to worship. If you would stand with me, we will read from Hosea 11, verses 1 through 9. Now, before we read these 11 verses, I promise I won't be long, but I want to kind of give you a little backdrop as to what you're reading. Um, when I worked through this passage this week, recognize that our children don't realize the impact of punishments and disciplines. And what I mean impacts, it not only impacts them, they think of their pain, of course, but it's also impactful to the parents. And that's what I believe God is relaying to us through these verses, is not only the waywardness of Israel, uh, he's having to punish them, but his punishment, punishing of them impacts him, and he speaks of his love for Israel. Now, in the first seven verses, he's really just about done with Israel because of their disobedience and their waywardness, uh, their deceit, and he even tells them regarding their punishment that you may you will not go back to Egypt, but you are going to be captured by Assyria. And so he is done with Israel. But in verse 8, there's something interesting that changes. And just like parents who discipline their children, there's always something about us where we can't give up on them. We may punish them. We discipline them, but we find ways we're to the point where we don't give up on them. And verse 8 seems to be what God is saying to us or to Israel, that I can't give up on you. He doesn't utterly destroy them. He even says, how can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboam. Adma and Zeboam were the two cities destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. How can I treat you and make you like those cities? And the reason is I'm God and not like man. So let's read those verses. I just wanted to give you a little backdrop as to what we're reading this morning. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboam? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you this morning. We are forever grateful that you are God and not man. Man can look at our disobedience, our waywardness, and would desire to utterly destroy us. But for whatever reason, God, you extended your vast love to us, those of us who are so undeserving, 
So God, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for always being faithful, always kind, and understanding that we are not. God, we just marvel at your goodness and your grace. In the midst of our wretchedness, God, you loved us before we could even think about loving ourselves. So we stand thankful today that you extended your great grace to us. You redeemed Israel during that time. But there's a greater redemption today through your son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you and praise you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll now recite our Apostles' Creed and 1 Timothy 3, 16. Apostles' Creed begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. 1 Timothy 3.16, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, taken up in glory. Let's glorify our Lord this morning. I think it's on the screens, but we're going to be singing from him 368, He Lives. and Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care and though my heart grows weary I never will despair I know that he is leading through all the stormy bells the day of his appearing will come at last he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me talks with me along life narrow way he lives he lives salvation to impart you ask me how i know he lives he lives within my heart rejoice rejoice oh christian lift up your voice and sing Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life narrow way. He lives. He lives salvation to impart. 
You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Father, we thank you for your son, a living Savior, yet today, God. And he stands interceding for us, oh, Father. So we thank you, God, that you would give us such a grace gift in Jesus Christ. And we stand grateful this morning, God. We get to hear your life-changing word this morning, God. I pray that we're in awe of you more after hearing your word this morning, God, than when we walked in here. So we thank you, God, for our pastor, that you would strengthen and encourage him, God, and enable him to speak forth what you've placed on his heart. We thank you. We praise you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Berean. It's good to see you here on this, our Lord's Day. Before our meditation, that I, before our offering, I want to just emphasize a couple of things for you so that uh, you'll be aware of what's taking place. Uh, I want to re reinforce for you the media announcement. Um, we do need some assistance with the, with the media ministry, particularly uh, we're in the process of having a, a new web page designed and we have to um, upload a number of things to that website, uh, sermons and uh, my, my daily devotionals that I write. And so we have a lot of of data we need to get onto the website and so uh, we need individuals who can be help with that and uh, you don't have to do the work here at church you can do it at home and so um, if, if you're able to help with that if you'll see Capel Davis uh, Capel uh, will be able to kind of lay out for you the uh, scope and sequence of what we're what we're hoping to accomplish uh, when we hope to get started but we do need some assistance please consider helping us uh, so that uh, we can expedite the process of our new uh, website being uh, up and active uh, and be, being able to minister effectively uh, to uh, to the church. Also, uh, let me apologize for our, uh, we're having some, obviously some problems with our screens and our um, projectors, which we're trying to get fixed. Um, but let me just give you a stopgap uh, for the sermon notes and slides. Uh, on our app, before I be, uh, before I I, uh, I come up to to uh, to preach, the media department uploads the outline of the sermon. Uh, all of the things you see on the slides are, are on the app, and so those of you who have some challenges seeing the screen, and um, you don't have to be old to have challenges to see the screen. Um, <laughs> so if you have challenges seeing the screen, if you go to our app. Go to the uh, to the media area where all of my sermons are, and uh, if you go to the most recent sermon, which will be the one I'm I'm presently preaching, that uh, you'll see a a, a a button there to uh, look at the notes, and if you, you pull that up, you'll get the entire outline that is gone on the that is on the slides. You'll see that there on your phone or your tablet. If you don't have the app, of course, you go to any of the uh, app stores, depending on whether you have a, an Android device, an iPhone, or a Windows device. Uh, you go to the app store, you do a search on Berean Bible Baptist Church. You'll, you'll see the app there. You just download the app, install it, and uh, you'll have access to all of our media, well, the media library we have uploaded at this time. You'll have access out of that, as well as other things about the, uh, the uh, church, as you know. And so uh, please be aware of that so that you can follow along without having to stress your eyes uh, like many of us do. As we prepare our hearts for our offering today, I might be turn to a, an unusual passage. Um, we try to give passages that encourage us in our, um, in our offering out of the Lord. This is an important part of worship. Uh, but a passage we don't often turn to is 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, 2 Peter chapter 2 is kind of a, not an odd passage, it's a wonderful passage, but it deals with uh, really false teachers. And uh, you wouldn't think in a text like this there'd be something to encourage us in our giving. Uh, but I would beg to differ with you a little bit on this, because uh, uh, there's something here that I, I believe that we all need to hear. Uh, you all know it as a church, but I just want to reinforce it uh, for you this morning. 
Second Peter chapter, I just want to read the first three verses of, of this chapter. It says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. I want to draw your attention particularly to the third verse there. Peter warns the church about people who want to exploit believers for greedy purposes. Quite frankly, we live in a day and age in which the church is an easy mark. Because we don't know our doctrine well, because we tend to attend church and not understand what we're witnessing, people can oftentimes come into the church, false teachers, and manipulate us and use us to get access to our wallets and our pocketbooks. Greed is what drives them, not Jesus Christ. One of the reasons why, as here at, at our church, we have an open book policy, and another reason why we give you all of our financials as a, as a church is because we want you to know what we're doing with your money. Let me rephrase that, what we're doing with the Lord's money. Because <laughs> that's whose money it is. Although you give it, it's the Lord's money. The Lord gave it to you, you give it out of the church, but you have expectations regarding its use. You intend for it to go for the purpose for which it was given. And so one of the reasons why we give you what we give you information-wise is because we want you to be able to give with confidence, knowing that the resources that God gives you that you in turn give to the church are being used in a way that would honor him and are not for the purpose of filling the pockets of greedy people. You can give with confidence, knowing that you have access to those resources. Keep that in mind as the ushers at this time prepare to come forth to receive our offering. We sing from him 572, Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. 
This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. short of our salvation blessed blessed assurance that the song says the assurance we have in our relationship with Jesus Christ we give praise and honor to the Lord and the assurance he gives us of our eternal salvation it was good this morning to um, those of you who were in Sunday school or were watching online of course um, know that we had our missionaries here, uh, Ted and Ava Marshall, and it was wonderful to see them. Uh, we hadn't seen them in a number of years, and it's good to see them again and to uh, hear of what God has been doing in their lives in Lego, Spain. A number of the members have already told me they were especially encouraged uh, to see Ava, who has been struggling mightily with her health over the last few years. She has a very rare disease that is debilitating but it was good to see her and it's good to uh to uh to know that god is faithfully caring for her even in the midst of her illness again i was challenged about how a ministry uh, goes on in the lives of god's people even when they're suffering even when they're in the midst of of hurt and pain we still find them laboring mightily for the lord jesus christ that's the mark of the true christian the mark of the true believer. Uh, we labor because of all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. It was a good reminder today of that. And Ava, of course, remains on the sick and shut-in list as we uh, want to pray for her and all those who are suffering under the, the pain of, of illness or uh, sickness, and that God would be compassionate and merciful and raise them up from their sick bed. Let's stand as we go to God in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, it is good to be assured <laughs> to have this blessed assurance that you who have begun the good work in us will complete it. that you're a finishing God. That you don't begin stuff and just leave them half done. But when you put your hand to it, it's going to happen. Oh Lord, we give you thanks today that we can trust you completely to do what only you can do. Save a soul. <laughs> change a man, change a woman into your child to completely transform our lives removing us from the domain of darkness and transferring us to the kingdom of your beloved son Jesus Christ thank you Lord God for you being a finishing God that you Heavenly Father will accomplish not some of your good pleasure, but all of your good pleasure. We thank you, for you truly are a great and awesome God. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us as your children to live in light of who you are, that we would live consumed with this finishing process in our own life, pursuing the righteousness with which you have 
conformed us to Christ. We pray, Lord God, that the things you have worked into our lives, the working and the willing that you would help us to work out in our daily walk with you, we pray. We thank you, Lord God, for our missionaries. Thank you so much for Ted and Ava, for Obed and, and for Lucas and Lucas's wife. We pray, Lord God, for the entire family that you would bless and keep them. We thank you as well for our missionary highlight family today, John and Rachel Sherwood, for their ministry through Cross World, Heavenly Father. We ask that you would use them mightily as well. We pray that as the gospel goes out, that the Spirit would work, that lives would be transformed, and that Christ would be magnified and glorified, we pray. We also lift up our sick and shut-in this morning, those within our fellowship for whom we're so concerned. We ask, dear God, you would visit them in kindness and mercy today. We lift up to you Carl Allen and Carol Allen. Frederick and Juanita Ball, Elder Bibbs, George Brown, Hugh Chinson, Azure DeBose, Elder Knox, Gloria Marshall, Joan McLean, Joyce Nelson, Aladdin Jones, Vicki Robinson, Teresa, Skeppel, Candace, Zachary, we pray to God you would meet their needs, accomplish your healing touch in their life, give their doctors wisdom, we pray the medications they're taking would accomplish their intended end. We pray also for our missionaries who are sick at this time, Naima Johnson, Ava Marshall, Obed Marshall, Judy Payne, Walter Robinson. Touch them, we pray. Heal them, we ask, dear God. Be kind and merciful to them in their health. We, we beseech you, Heavenly Father, on their behalf. We thank you also for this offering that was given. We pray you would use it to further your kingdom and to glorify your great and awesome name, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We'll sing from him 356 redeemed. His presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. 
redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Isn't it good to be redeemed, church? <laughs> Blood bought, Amen. purchased by Jesus Christ, his death accomplishing in us life. We thank God for the redemption that we have in Jesus. What a payment price. The Bible says that the there is no price that can be offered in the human realm for the human soul. It's too costly. But we thank God that there was one who paid the ultimate price that we might experience eternal life. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the sixth chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 6, and we will be looking at the verses 1 through 6 of Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, let's stand for the reading of God's word. The Bible says... Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. But select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may, who we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurius, Nicandor, <clears throat> Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid hands on them. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for your word. We have sung praises to your holy name. We have prayed and lifted up our requests to you. We've shared with you our offering, returning to you what you have so wonderfully given to us. And now, Heavenly Fathers, we turn to Holy Scripture. We need to hear from you. We need you to speak to us through your word. And so we ask, Heavenly Father, you would grant us an understanding mind and fill us 
With wisdom we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Acts chapter 6 is the first experience of potential ethnic division in the church. In fact, it will be the first time that the church was in real danger of actually dividing within itself, leaving two large bodies of separate believers. Fracture into two separate churches was a real danger surrounding the events in this chapter. But this was not the only problem. You see, maybe the church would remain a whole unit physically, but something along the lines of what was true of the church of Corinth would take place. Divisions would take over the uh, church this time, not based on personalities as they were in Corinth, but rather based on ethnicity. The two ethnic groups always being distrustful and antagonistic towards each other. What would happen to the church in this context? We have spent the last four sermons of our study of the book of, uh, on the study of Acts 6, wrestling with not only what was going on surrounding this event, but also the various biblical and sociological frameworks of that day and our own day in reference to ethnicity. We're now ready to conclude our study of this historical event by turning to how the church responded to the potential danger and lived out the reality of its creed. Its creed, so wonderfully summarized by Paul in Galatians 3, 28 and 29. There we read these words, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Listen, church, ears according to the promise. This is our creed. So from the problem found in chapter 6, verse 1, we move next to the solution, chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. It would be easy to let the slight that takes place in verse 1 to deteriorate into a discussion and debate on ethnicity. Why the ethnic Hebrew Jews had a problem with the ethnic Hellenistic Jews. Remember, church, that the only human illustration the church had for how different ethnicities could relate in a religious context was Judaism, which had organized itself, we learned last week, along lines of division, ethnically speaking, in their synagogues. If you were a Hebrew Jew, you went to a Hebrew Jew synagogue. If you were a Hellenistic Jew in Jerusalem, you went to a Hellenistic Jew synagogue. That's how ethnicities worked. Would the church take that illustration and copy it for the church? In the modern church, as I noted last week, we would have sponsored a series of workshops, rallies, or seminars on racial reconciliation. The early church assumed none of those things, but dealt with the problem as presented, resolving it with a solution that fit the problem. What's the difference between the church we see here and, and us? Many in the modern church begin with the assumption that you are a racist and can be nothing but a racist, and everything you do is tainted by your racism. Why did the early church not do this? 
in spite of the real cultural differences between Hellenistic and Hebrew Jews. The reason they didn't begin there is because they thought and acted towards confessing believers as if they were believers and helped and held them accountable to their confession. Now, some might claim, well, pastor, you're just naive about how humans really work. Well, if you've been following me over the last four sermons, rather than tuning me out, you know that that's not the case. <laughs> you see, church, I know, biblically speaking, that not all problems that break along ethnic lines are simply misunderstandings. Did you forget my mention of Galatians chapter 2 and the ethnic bias witnessed in the incident recorded in that text? As Barnabas, in light of his Jewish homies, withdrawing from Gentiles? You, 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 do you forget that, I, that we talked about that right up front? Yes, ethnic favoritism and even ethnic hatred can arise in spiritual contexts. After all, Christians can act sinfully. But if that's the only stick that you have for understanding issues that break along ethnic lines, then you're spiritually dangerous to the church. Part of our problem is that some modern Christians have adopted the perspective and attitude of the world as if the world knows better how human beings actually work than the Bible. They trust CRT more than they trust God to tell us how human beings really work. We assume everything is a Galatians 2 incident and ignore Acts 6 altogether. Not every situation, not every controversy within the church starts out as a sin. Luke here in chapter 6, verses 2 through 4, records for us how the church responded to the situation and problem identified in verse 1. Verses 2 through 4 read as follows. Let me read them for you again. And the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. But select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we, listen, will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And here we see Luke's record of the origin of the solution, the need for a solution, the solution itself and then another accounting of the need for a solution. First, let's begin this morning with the origin of the solution. Where did the solution come from? The text says, and the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples. Stop there. Although we're not told whether the remarks made by the Hellenistic Jews were made directly to the apostles, what what was said eventually made its way up to the leadership of the church. Of course, this was a necessary occurrence given what we've already seen recorded in the book of Acts. Let me retrace with you for just a moment how the church cared for itself and how Luke recorded its care throughout the early part of the book of Acts. You can see why the disciples had to be the ones to interject an answer. Go back to chapter 2 of Acts. In chapter 2 of Acts, at the very founding of the, the, very founding of the church, the very beginning of the uh, church, we read in chapter 2, verse 44, that, listen, they had all things in common. That was, the, that was how the early church ran. 
they had all things going. This resulted in verse 45, which says, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Now, you can imagine that a situation like that might become a little bit chaotic, a little bit unorganized and inefficient. People just selling their stuff and, and giving, giving up. There has to be some type of accountability in that process. There has to be some type of way to keep track of what's going on. And so we're not surprised four chapters later, I'm sorry, two chapters later, that we see the accountability begin to be interjected into what was taking place. In chapter 4, the disciples interjected themselves clearly into this, into this process. The church continued to care for itself. In chapter 4, verse 34, Luke recorded the fact that the Holy Spirit's working among their midst led to the needy not having any needs. All the, all the physical needs of the church body were being handled by the church. How? Look at verse 35 of chapter 4. People were selling their property and they would lay the proceeds, they would lay them at the apostles' feet and they would distribute to each as they had need. And so the disciples become the clearinghouse, if you will, for the physical needs of the congregation to be met. Chapter 5 opens up with the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They were a bad example of people selling their stuff and bringing it to the disciples. They were trying to manipulate God's people and God killed them on the spot. But Barnabas is a good example and he occurs at the end of chapter 4. We see Barnabas selling his land and bringing it and laying it at the disciples' feet and they're using those resources to care for the congregation. It's no surprise then in our text, chapter 6, the source of authority within, within the body, humanly speaking, the team of leaders, the apostles acted. They responded to what was going on in the, in, in the church by summoning the congregation of the disciples. Now, when we looked at, chapter, when we looked at verse 1 of this chapter, I didn't mention this, but the word disciple is used for the first time in the book of Acts here in chapter 6. Uh, we see that the great commission given to the church is being executed. Christ said, go and make disciples, and so we see disciples being made. What's interesting, however, uh, is that this word disciple isn't used outside of the book of Acts. So uh, at the end of the book of Acts, that'll be the last time we hear the phrase disciple. The letters of the New Testament don't use that phrase to describe Christians. This is an early, an early descriptive phrase of the Christian, the follower of Jesus Christ. The congregation, notice in our text, was not polled. The disciples didn't go, you know what, what do you think we ought to do? The, the apostolic authority did not go to the church and ask them for their counsel and guidance. The apostles informed the fellowship in the manner in which this situation was going to be taken care of. The nexus of authority still remained with the leadership, watch this, although it may very well have been a problem with the system up to this point. So for some reason, the, the meals, the, the care for the widows is not getting to the widows. Something is happening between people selling their property, giving it to the disciples, and then the disciples distributing it to everybody who has needs. There's something within that system that's not running on all cylinders. But the church doesn't go outside of its leadership structure to fix the problem. The problem must be fixed by the apostles, the origin of the solution. What was the need for the solution? Look at the second half of verse 2. It is not desirable, the text says, for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Something had to change, but it wasn't going to be the word of God that changed. 
Follow me here, church. It's clear that there were two large areas of responsibility to which the leadership of the church were responsible. One was the Word of God, that is the preaching and teaching, and the other big area of responsibility was care for the membership. Care for the membership manifested in our text as serving tables, caring for the well-being of the flock. As we've seen up to this time, the apostles had executed both of these responsibilities. But with the size of the congregation and the reality that some were, be, were slipping through the cracks, it was clear that the second of these had, to, had outstripped their capacity. They could no longer be the ones to make the distribution. Not because of their inability, but because of their priority. Follow me here. The duty remained theirs. Otherwise, how could they assign it to somebody else? The duty remained theirs, but they were not going to implement that duty because to implement it would mean something for the Word of God. Key to their decision-making process was that they were not going to take care of this elevated care issue in the church if it led to the neglect of the Word of God. This, they indicated, was not at all desirable. The emphasis in this statement was on this term, desirable. Desirable. What, is it, what, is it, what does this word mean? This term came from a legal family of words. It, it spoke to the idea of making peace or reconciling two individuals. In other words, establishing a positive relationship between two things or two parties. Eventually, the Greek dropped the legal idea and focused on the result of an established positive relationship. In other words, something that was pleasing, acceptable, or agreeable. In our context here, this word is negated. So there is something that is unacceptable to the apostles. It was not pleasing to them. What was unacceptable? That their capacity to, or their actual teaching of the Word of God, would be jeopardized in any way. They referred to this as neglecting the Word of God. Neglecting the Word of God. Now, when, when the Greeks translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, they used this exact word, neglect, here to translate the word in Hebrew that describes a man who leaves his mother and father and marries his wife. The idea of leaving is this word, neglect. It had a wide range of meanings. It could mean to forsake something. It could mean to go away from it, to, to abandon it, or to leave it behind. The root word from which it was derived was used for the biblical idea of remnant. What, what's a, what was a, a remnant? A, a remnant was a group that was left behind after another group was removed and judged. So what the apostles are concerned about here is that they would be forced to curb their study of God's word and or their communication of God's word, that they would have to abandon it in order to serve tables. This was unacceptable to them completely. Now, I could preach a whole sermon on it. A church that does not prioritize the capacity of its pastors to study and teach the word has failed in its priorities. If you're not coming to church to hear the Bible preached, you're not coming to church for the right reason. If you're coming to hear the choir, if you're coming for the children's ministry, If you're even coming for relationships, 
you're missing the primary purpose for why you should be here. What the believer needs more than anything else is the Word of God. When all the world is out of control, what's the one stability in the believer's life? God's Word. When your life is crumbling around you, when it's fraying at the ends, what is the one stabilizing force in the believer's life? The Word of God. It's the Word that the church needs more than anything else. And, that, and the disciples said, we ain't doing it. <laughs> they recognized it was a need, but they said, we're not going to lift a finger with that one. Because for us to seek to fulfill that meant that we'd have to curb what happens with the Word of God. And that's not going to happen. We're not going to serve tables rather than teach and preach the Word. The word table here, or tables, was a general term for furniture, obviously. <laughs> Or used for eating or, or that you use in, in a store where you might sell something. We see these uses in the Bible. Uh, by itself, in, in Acts chapter 6, verse 34, when it's used by itself, it represents having a meal, which was obviously the use here. That which would distract the apostles from their task related to the word of God would be serving such meals. The, the description of this idea has led many pastors, teachers, and Christians to assume that this chapter focused on the creation of the office of deacon in the church. Now, why would they do that? Because of the family of terms from which this term was derived, serving tables. I want to stop here for a moment and just, just spend a little time on this word and on this idea that this text introduces deacons into the, into the system, into the church system, I want to I examine that so that we can really understand what's going on here. Is, is this chapter, is the purpose of this chapter, as many teach, to be the foundation for deacons in the church? I would say, no, it's not. Now, why would I say that? Well, let's, I'm going to take you through my argument. Let's, let's, let's spend a little time here before, before we get back to the flow of this particular passage. The idea of to serve tables was translated from the Greek verb diakoneo, diakoneo. This word is related to the Greek term diakonos, which means servant. But it is also translated deacon in the New Testament, the same word. There's a third term related to these two words, diakoneo which refers to the activity of serving. So we have to serve, we have servant, and we have serving. Three words, three different Greek words that appear in, in our Bibles. The, these three terms are very common in the Bible and are used about 30 times or more each. The family of terms has at its, as its very root the idea of performing a servile or a lowly task. Their root meaning, from which the other meanings are derived, is to wait on table. To wait on a table. All three of these terms were used in, the sense, in this sense in, in the New Testament. The verb was used in Luke chapter 17, verse 8. There, uh, Jesus told, told a parable, and in the parable was a servant and a master. And it says in verse 8, the, the master speaks to the servant, and he says, prepare something for me to eat, and properly clothe yourself, and serve me. There's the word, serve me, until I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. The verb, the verb to serve. The descriptive noun is used in Luke chapter 10, verse 40. There we have the story of Martha making preparations to feed Jesus and his entourage. In Luke 10, verse 40, it says, But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up and said, 
and to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? There's our word. Then tell her to help me. The noun, which describes the person doing the service, is used of the table waiters at the wedding in Cana. You know, the wedding that Jesus went to in Cana, John chapter 2, verse 5. There we read, his mother said to the servants, there's our word, whatever he says to you, do it. So it can be seen that this term has service in a human sense at the heart of it and in its meaning. Although service is the, is the base meaning of these terms, uh, they grew to be very flexible and therefore they're translated in a lot of different ways in, in our Bibles. Let me just run through some of the ways this, this word, these words are translated. To minister, Mark 4, verse 11. To take care, Matthew 25, verse 44. Contributing to support, Luke 8, verse 3. To care for, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3. Preparations, Luke 10, verse 40. Ministry, verse, uh, Acts 1, verse 17. Relief, Acts 11, verse 29. Mission, Acts 12, verse 25. Minister, Rome, Romans 13, 4. Bond servant, Colossians 1, 7. So this, this, this phrase, this phraseology, this, these words occur throughout the New Testament and are translated in various ways. Beyond the secular usage of these terms, there are some very distinct Christian uses. Let me look at three of these we use with you. Number one is a general one which describes Christian ministry or service. That is, in some way, serving God's ends. I would say this is by far the most dominant New Testament use of this family of terms. And Christ is the pattern. Christ's work in salvation is a service. Do you know that Christ served you? When he died for you, that was a service that he, he gave for you particularly. Mark 10 verse 45 tells us that. Jesus says in Mark 10 verse 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served. Why did he come? He came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to pay the price for you. And in paying the price, he was serving you. But, but even before his death, do you know that Jesus lived the life of a servant? Christ set the pattern. Good church leadership is marked by service. Isn't that true? Luke tells us that. Luke 22, verses 26 and 27 says this. This is, again, Jesus talking. He says, Let him who is greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as the servant. For who is greater? Listen to Jesus' logic. For who is greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table, but I am among you as the one who serves? Christ says, check this out. I'm serving you. That doesn't make sense. I'm God of God. I'm, I'm, I'm the Lord of the universe. I'm divine, and yet what am I doing? Serving y'all. What a pattern. Is your life marked by service, Christian? Is Christ just here to serve you, but you're not going to serve him? Is the church just here to pray for you, to teach you, to minister to your children, but you don't have time to serve the church? Mm. My pastor used to call that the leech Christian. Serve me, pray for me, help me in my time of crisis, meet me when I have needs, but don't ask me to do anything. Really? Christ is our pattern. He came to serve us. That motivates us to serve one another. So what are the, what are the disciples saying? If, if that's what this word means, are the disciples saying they don't want to serve anybody? Is that what they're saying? We don't want to serve table. We don't want to serve anybody. No, that's not, that's not the point. Because this word was used by the disciples to describe themselves. 
the apostles looked at the work that they were doing and they described their work as a service. Peter, for example, referred to the unique office of, a, of an apostle as a service, that is a ministry, when they replaced Judas in Acts chapter 1, verse 17. But service is not just for the leaders. That's what I pay you for, Pastor. Why are you getting a salary? To serve. Don't ask me to do anything. That's what you're here for. And it's funny how <laughs> Christians think that pastors are the only one who's supposed to visit the sick in the hospital. Really? Is that what the Bible says? Don't you have responsibility too? <laughs> All of us are required to serve, the Bible teaches. One of the true marks of being a follower of Christ is being a servant. Someone involved in Christian ministry, John 12, verse 16, Ephesians 4, verse 12, Hebrews 6, verse 10, Revelation 2, verse 19. All of us, the, the, the variety of gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to Christians indicates that there is a variety of ministries in which they are to be involved. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 5 tells us, all believers... If they're going to be obedient to the word, are required to be involved in some aspect of Christian ministry and service to other believers. It's who we are, Ephesians 5, verse 12. There's even a gift of service. I don't have the gift of service. Maybe I don't have to serve. I don't have a gift. No, everybody serves. But some people are uniquely gifted by God, and they serve all over the place. Peter says, of all of us, however, listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, verse 10. As each one has received a special gift, and all of us have, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. How do you, how do you evidence that you, have, you, are, you are a good steward of the manifold grace of God, how do you demonstrate that? By serving in the church. That's how you demonstrate it. Has God's grace really impacted you? Is it, is it true that God has changed you? How's it going to show up? In your service. But within the larger body of believers, there are individuals who have been set aside in a particular office that has service as its foundation. They're called deacons. Deacons. Just as there is an office of leadership in the church, there's also a second office which focuses upon service, the office of deaconess, elders and deacons. Although everyone in the church is involved in service, this group, the deacons, are individuals who fulfill a unique function in the body on behalf of the elders and related to the sheep. I like to call them the servants' servants. The servants' servants'. There are only two passages in the New Testament which clearly identify the office of deacon. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, and Philippians chapter 1. I preached on both of those texts, and so you can go back and listen to the messages if you want. But those are the only two texts that specifically and clearly identify deacons. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, and Philippians 1, verse 1. Other than that, when the, when the word dikonos is used, the meaning is this more general description of someone serving the Lord. There is no firm foundation for identifying a specific deacon in the New Testament. Let me give you an, an, an example of this. Individuals like Tychicus, Ephesians 6.21, and Epaphras, Colossians 1.7, are called dikonos by Paul. But he also calls himself Apollos and Timothy dikonos as well, although they weren't deacons. What I'm saying is we have no way to identify in the Bible a specific deacon. 
the identification of the seven men in Acts 6, 1 through 6 as deacons is problematic. First off, nowhere in our passage are the seven identified as deacons. Nowhere. Although waiting on tables was mentioned, the designation diakonos is absent from the description. Secondly, it's more likely that these seven individuals oversaw the service and did not actually do the service themselves. Why? How large is the Jerusalem church by the time this, this text is written? At minimum, 8,000 people. At minimum, 8,000. In all likelihood, it's closer to 20,000 or more. That's how big this church was. Many of the people who were part of that church were Hellenistic. And so there would have been a large number of widows in that group. The idea that these seven men alone are going to be the ones that serve all those widows is unlikely. They were to organize the effort to make sure that the situation in Acts 6 verse 1 didn't repeat itself. We don't want any widows in our church to be without a meal. That can't happen again. And so they, they, they come up with a plan in order to solve that problem. This is, not, this is not the beginning of the office of deacons. I think that, that type of logic misses the point of this text. The solution. The solution next. What will they do? <laughs> the Bible says, but verse 3, but select from among you Hellenistic brethren. Is that what it says? Look at the Bible. Don't look at me, look at the Bible. <laughs> but select from among you Hellenistic brethren. Is that what it says? Hmm. This definitely isn't the modern church. Look, look, look at this text. But select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and, and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this. No mention of them being Hellenistic. Just keep that in the back of your mind for just a minute. What's the solution? What do we do to make sure that the Hellenistic Jews, the widows, no longer are skipped or missed in the daily serving of food. How do we do this? We track down the most spiritual men in the congregation and put them in charge. <laughs> Seven men. And listen again to the qualifications of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. First off, notice, they want the congregation to select certain people, to select certain people. The term for selection here was interesting. It had at its, at, at its core the idea of demonstrating a concern or interest. Demonstrating a concern or interest. The, this idea manifested itself in a couple of important ways in the Bible. First off, it spoke of the idea of looking upon, considering, or having regard for something or someone. In, 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 uh, when, it's, when, it, when that's the meaning of this term, it, it often refers to the concept of to examine, to examine or to inspect or to investigate something or someone. The second way this, this term is used is to, is to visit someone. Well, what, what does visit have to do with concern? Well, well you, you, you visit them out of concern for them. It's obvious that the first use is the idea expressed in our text. The, the leadership wanted the congregation to take special and careful note of the situation and to choose individuals that would be most able to fill in where the problems were being experienced. The church 
would not be careless and frivolous in the selection. Why? The situation, the situation couldn't be solved just by anybody. Follow me here, church. This is an interesting situation that we get to here, the, here this morning. In, in our study of the book of Acts, it wasn't until chapter 5 that we began to see that not everybody in the church is in the same place. When Ananias and Sapphira do their thing, we realize, I guess everybody isn't as spiritual as chapter 2 seemed to imply. So there's different levels of spirituality in the people of God. Not everybody's at the same place. The Spirit's not working the same, at the same pace in everybody in, in every way. Some people are responding more to the Spirit than others are. Some people read their Bible more than others do. Some Christians attend church more often than others do. That's the way it is. And so the Spirit of God, the life of God, is being manifested at different paces in, in the church. And that shouldn't surprise us. Not everybody in a family is at the same place, physically speaking. Some people are younger than them, some people are older. Some people you, who are older, you wish that they were really were older and didn't act so young. Okay, and, and, so, and so people are at different, different places. That's true of the church as well. So the apostles say, go amongst yourself. Go amongst y y yourself and, and have an eye open for some qualities. <laughs> There's some things that you need to mark in these individuals so this task can happen. Number one, choose people of good reputation. Good reputation. Now, the reputation he was particularly concerned about was being full of the spirit and of wisdom. Being full of the spirit and of wisdom. Let's, let's break this down for us here. First off, as was biblically normative from Genesis Till John, this is, John is the last book before Acts, these individuals would be taken from the male population of the converted. The word in our text here is not just men, generally speaking, human beings. The word used by Luke is the Greek word for male. Male, M-A-L-E. Again, as you know from my years of instruction to you, this is not because men are better than women. That's not why this is here. This is solely because God's divine will and choice is that males lead in the congregation. Same as the family, same as the church. That fact supersedes all of the factors you can bring forth to decide on who can lead an effort within the church. When it comes to leadership, we can be sure that we're going to restrict the leadership to males. It's the will of God. I don't think it's fair. Well, who are you? Women didn't have all the education that they have. That's true. I don't doubt that's the case. When is the last time God decided what he was going to do based on what people could do? We do what God says to do. Why? Because it's his will that's the most important in our lives over everything else. But not just males. That wasn't good enough. You being a man isn't good enough. Just because just you're a man don't mean that you should be a leadership. You needed to have a good reputation. This term, reputation, is taken from the Greek verb meaning to witness or to give evidence. It was a legal term. The, the form that Paul used it in here, in our text, means to be witnessed or testified about. In other words, to be well spoken of, approved, or attested. Hmm. 
Here, we see that when it comes to the church and guiding and leading it, you need to be a man of a good reputation. Now, it's fascinating to me that, that this is true, this is a side note, this is true of everybody that the church supports. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul says that we're to support widows who are widows indeed. How do you know a good widow to support from a bad widow to support? Paul says, her reputation. So when it comes to the church, the church is always concerned about reputation. Now, not because it's, in, not, not because it's concerned with eye service, but it's reputation before God and men. Reputation before God and men. So, good reputation. What else is true of them? How, is, how does that good reputation manifest itself? Well, them being full of the Spirit and of wisdom. To be full of the Spirit, as we've noted time and time again throughout the book of Acts, speaks to the control of the individual by the Holy Spirit. They're controlled by the Spirit. The apostles are concerned that the congregation identify individuals of whom it can be plainly seen that they prioritize the things of the spirit. They are sensitive to spiritual matters and manifest within their dealings with others biblically, char biblically character, character traits defined by, by the Holy Spirit himself. What am I saying? <laughs> traits that the spirit produces. This is Galatians 5, 22 and 23, of course. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are all characteristics that the Spirit produces in the Christian's life. But not just full of the Spirit, also full of wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom has always been and has always stood through the generations of God's people as a disposition of those who are tuned to the word of God and the will of God. Such wisdom grew out of not just fearing God, but learning from God's word and his precepts. Therefore, this is a person who takes God and his word seriously and pursues conformity to it in themselves. These men that they were to choose from were clearly to be those committed to the instruction being given to them in the church by the apostles. The men that the congregation were to choose should evidence a commitment to the hearing and the following of God's word to his, and, 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 and therefore his wisdom. Some men within the church just prioritize God's word and sitting under it more than others do. This is a fact. This is a fact. Some men prioritize God's word more. The apostle said, choose men that are prioritizing the word and its teaching and the wisdom that is found there. This is a powerful, powerful description of those who should be leading within the church. They are to be Men, males in specific, who are pursuing the fruit of the Spirit in their own lives, seeking to submit more and more to his control rather than their own. They are committed to the teaching ministry of the uh, church, observable and obviously learning from the preaching and the teaching of the fellowship, seeking to commit themselves to the, to the consequences of God's word more and more. Their reputation in conduct and submission to biblical preaching and teaching is plainly seen. What, why, why would they choose such men? The apostles say, whom we, who, whom we may put in charge of this task. Whom we may put in charge of this task. The idea of put in charge was translated from a flexible word that meant to, to set something down, to, to put something in, 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 in a certain place physically. It could be used figuratively to describe putting someone in a specific 
position or state, installing them, appointing them, elevating them to a certain office or status. And this is the point here. But notice, it wasn't the congregation putting them in that place. The we is a reference to the apostles. They're going to entrust them with this task. Mm, what was this task? What was this task? This is the third time this word task is used in the book of Acts. In the two previous uh, verses it was used, it's translated need. Need. I don't, I don't need to miss this. Need. In chapter 2, verse 45, chapter 4, verse 35, it's translated as need. These verses read, and, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. There's the word. Uh, chapter 4, verse 35. And, and, lay, and they lay them at the apostles' feet and they would distribute to each as they had need. Now, why do I bring this up? The caring, of wi the caring for widows was not something the church chose to do. It's something it had to do. It was a need. It had to happen. All throughout the Bible, the Bible talks about the responsibility of the church to meet the needs of its people. Those who are truly in need should be able to find help for their need within the congregation. And then verse 4. Again, we come to the need for a, a solution. It says, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It's important to affirm that these matters were, were matters of priority, not importance. The service to the widows was important, but no service to the church can eclipse the service supplied by the leadership of prayer and the ministry of the word. This is how pastoral care is most definitively expressed. As a pastor, I can say that I've carried out my pastoral duties, not perfectly, but consistently over the years. I have comforted sa saints in their time of loss. I have visited and called saints when they were sick. I have counseled saints and I've performed weddings, funerals, and dedications over my 20 plus years of pastoral ministry here at our church. But no more important duty do I have than to pray for you regularly and to teach you Holy Scripture. Every week, I call your name out before the Lord specifically. If you have children, I lift up your children to the Lord. If there are particular, if there are particular prayer requests that you have, I, I pray for those. Some of them I've been praying for, for you all. Some prayer requests I've been praying for really about four or five years or more. This is the responsibility of leadership. Prayer and the word. The apostles indicated in this text that they were determined to devote themselves to these two duties. This term has been used several times already in, 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 uh, by Luke in Acts and referred to the idea of to persist obstinately in something. This was to approach something with an un relenting stubbornness. The apostles say, we're not going to be moved from this. Praying for you and preaching and teaching the word of God for you, that is what our priority is. We're going to endure in that. This word meant to, to uh, it, it, it came from a word that, that meant to be strong, to be courageous, to endure. Their priorities would be fixed and unmovable. They're going to pray and they're going to teach the word. And so, how do they implement the plan? Verses 5 and 6 and then we're done. Luke recorded the, impl the implementation in verses 5 and 6. Well did the author of Hebrews write of the relationship between leadership and congregation. He said in, chapter, in Hebrews 13, verse 17, Obey your leaders 
and submit to them. Why? For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Believers and leadership are to work in harmony with each other, with, with believers submitting themselves to the leadership of the church and the leadership directing them by biblically normative guidance. And that's what we see here in our text. The apostles gave the word and the congregation responded. Verse 5. And the statement found approval with the whole congregation and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicandor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. We are completely unsurprised here to see a unity that encompasses the entire flock. This was normative in the book of Acts. There was complete unanimity amongst the, the brethren with, with the leadership, and they launched off and implemented the plan. Although the steps that were taken for implementation are not recorded, the result is recorded. Seven men were selected. Of the seven individuals chosen, Acts only has further information on two of these men. Stephen, and Philip. However, watch this. <laughs> Follow me here closely. All seven of the names were Greek in origin, which tells us that they were all related to the Hellenistic group of Christians. However, with the final individual, Nicholas, he was described as a proselyte, meaning what? He was a Gentile. So the other six had to be Jews. What does this tell us? The congregation, concerned about reassuring the Hellenistic Jews, drew the individuals who'd be working directly with their widows from their number. Wow. Now watch this, church. This was not a prerequisite. Don't miss this. The apostles did not make this a prerequisite. The Hellenistic Jews didn't ask for this. this hey, can you please make sure that everybody that you choose is like us? None of that went on. Such a prerequisite would be tantamount to acquiescing to worldly and humanistic methods in the church. The only ones that can minister to black folk are black folk. Only ones who can minister to white folk are white folk. Unless you've been a drunk like me, you can't minister to me if, I'm, if, I'm, if I've been a drunk. You don't know what I've been through. How are you and your little ivory tower going to help me? We have all of these humanistic, godless perspectives on people that don't match the Holy Scripture. What do you need to minister to people? Hmm. Seems to me the Bible is sufficient. Well, some of us don't believe it, but I believe the Bible is sufficient in itself. Neither the apostles nor the Hellenistic Jews themselves requested that everybody come from the Hellenistic group. However, with the church, watch this, fulfilling the spiritual demands first and foremost, they were free to choose within those boundaries and select men who identified the problem in the first place. The church, listen, the church refused to divide from each other along cultural or ethnic lines, but they would evidence sensitivity to the groups that were part of the household of God. The devil's attempt to make ethnicity an issue was thwarted. 
was thwarted. These believers acted in the power of the Holy Spirit and, and with sensitivity towards men. The only prerequisites were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Men of good reputation. Within that boundary, d- does it matter who you choose? Nope. Okay, well, you all ad- identify the problem, we'll put you in charge of it. Why? Because the spiritual requisites were met first. We also can't miss the fact here in this verse <laughs> that S- Stephen received a particular description. He was the man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. This, this sets up the Stephen story. He'll be the, next, he'll be the next story in the book of in chapter 6. He fulfilled the expectations of the apostles fully, as no doubt all the rest of these men did. But watch this, church. The selection of these men by the congregation wasn't good enough. Just because the congregation said, yep, these, these men are good, that didn't mean get started. They had to have the approval of the apostles, verse 6. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. <laughs> when selecting the individuals to guide God's people, it is important for there to be an agreement between those to whom the ministry will be directed and those whose responsibility is to give leadership to God's people. These men were brought before the apostles. And what did they do? Number one, they prayed. Why? Because no effort of man is sufficient. (laughs) No effort of men is sufficient. Unless God is working in that solution, it's not going to happen. God must be there. And so the first thing that they did, number one on the list, was to pray. And to ask for God's intervention in the situation. That God would not allow the, the, the potential problem to become a problem. God do what only you can do. But not only did they pray for them. They laid their hands on them. This act of laying on of of hands upon those who would be doing the service was an official act carried out to commission or commend someone to a task. This is the case in both Old and New Testament occurrences of this this act. Numbers 8, verse 10. Numbers 27, verse 18. Deuteronomy 34, verse 9. Acts 13, verse 1. 1 Timothy 5, 22. 2 Timothy 1, verse 1. Verse 6, the laying on of hands is a commissioning, it's a commending. It took place on the threshold of that person's service and was always carried out by the leadership. These men have the full sanction of the apostles to function regarding their duty identified here. They would be operating in the apostles' authority, carrying out the intentions of God. The problem was solved. As we consider what we've seen here in this account of Acts over the last five messages, we cannot miss the lessons that stand out to us. First off, problems can arise within the uh, church that break along ethnic lines. While clearly it is God's will for the, for the singular church to be in a multi-ethnic community of people, that does not mean that everything will sail along smoothly when it comes to ethnicities mixing in God's global people or a local manifestation of it. Human weakness, human imperfection, circumstances, and yes, sometimes even sinful conduct can be the cause of ethnic disruption in the body. Number two, that being the case, we also see here that harmony 
within the fellowship demands both acknowledgement of the problem while not condemning and excoriating the other party with, within which the problem centers. It's critical. Believers understand that while actions can be seen and words can be heard, hearts can't be read or known by men. Christians assume the best of each other unless hypocrisy or favoritism is witnessed in the act itself. Barnabas' shift from eating with Gentiles to not eating with Gentiles in Galatians 2 was an obvious and blatant ethnic bias. This situation in Acts 6 was not. A third important lesson here is that the acknowledgement of the problem must be met with a spiritual solution. Follow me here. Understanding people's pain or concern is not good enough. Or I understand your pain. No, you don't. That's not good enough. For the church to be the church, its actions must align with Holy Scripture. But watch this. But, but opting to adopt the, adopt the world's means and methods for dealing with any problem, including the, including the ones that break along ethnic lines, brings shame to the name of Christ and shows the world around us that God's intentions and God's purposes are in fact impossible, so God can't be trusted when he speaks. When we adopt the world's methods in the church, that reflects on God. God, you're not good enough. We need to go to the world because you can't handle this. The solutions we adopt must witness a sensitivity to the problem that serves to reassure without manipulating people or compromising Scripture's demands. Like CRT does, by the way, which we've talked about over the last four weeks. The, the, the demand of unity within God's church is not a pipe dream, but a godly expectation. When the Bible identifies the fact that brotherly love transcends all earthly differences, it's true. It's true. It transcends all earthly differences. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks this day for Christ and the brotherly love that he has given us in the church. But we recognize what the Bible says, that we must, it directs us to practice brotherly love. Just because we've been given it doesn't mean that we're practicing it. Living it out in our relationships with each others, with each other, yes, even those across ethnic lines from us. We cannot allow the divisions of human existence to be the divisions in the church. Help us, Lord God. To not allow the devil to get the victory in this area. But let us fight to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace in God's church. For anyone under the sound of my voice who has not given themselves to Jesus Christ this morning, They will continue to hate and be biased towards others until they submit to Jesus Christ, turn their lives to him, over to him in faith and obedience. And I pray that today they would do so. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. And with us and turn to him 410, him 410, standing on the promises. of Christ my King through eternal ages let his praises ring glory in the highest I will shout and sing standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of god my savior standing standing i'm standing on the promises of god standing on the promises i now can see Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me Standing in the liberty when Christ makes free Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God My Savior Standing, standing standing on the promises of God standing on the promises of Christ the Lord bound to him eternally by love's strong cord overcoming daily with the spirit's sword standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. There's no place or no safer place to stand and on the promises of God. We rest secure in him, and we're thankful for his securing of our lives. We're thankful for you being a part of our worship this morning. I want to take a few moments and welcome any first-time visitors. If this is your first time with us, if you just raise your hand so we can acknowledge you. Any first-time visitors with us this morning? Good. Thanks to have you. It's good to have you. Thanks for being a part of our worship this morning. I believe our ushers will have something for you in just a moment. I do want to uh, remind all of those who would like to receive more information how you can join our church uh, you can meet uh, Elder Marlin after church to my left your right right down here and he'll give you all the information about how you can become a church member here at Berea and I want to also remind you that this evening is our Bible study as we continue in the word of God we hope to see you at six o'clock as we study second Thessalonians that's bound a word of prayer as we close this morning Heavenly Father we want to give you thanks for the promises that you've given us and those promises, your word says, are amen in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of Christ. We thank you for the promises you've given us. We ask that you would enable us to walk in unity this week, we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen.